was your life like way back when, when you were doing secular music? It was exciting in that when I was a kid, I really believed, you know, my parents were musicians and they sung gospel music. And I lived in Georgia in the Old South in the Bible Belt. Gospel music was pretty big. And I would, I would go to school during the week, and then on the weekends I'd get to go out with my parents, and sometimes I'd go play to, you know, 15,000 people, and then I'd just be back being normal on Monday, and it was sort of cool. It was like a schizo, you know what I mean? I'd get to dream about, I'd get to see the spotlights and get to dream about uh, being a successful musician. They had instruments all over the house, you know. They had uh, guitars and basses, and, and uh, my uncle and my mom, dad, my mom played piano, my dad played guitar, and banjo and mandolin. They were hillbillies from Tennessee. <laughs> and um, my uncle played fiddle and all, all kinds of things. And so I grew up with those instruments around and learned to play some of them. They, by the time I got to be a teenager, my parents had a studio. And I could get in that studio at the end of the day after they were through. I'd go in there and... Uh, you know, make demos, write songs and things. And I think at that age in high school, I would tell people I was going to be a songwriter because that was a desire in my heart. But, um, you know, guys from Georgia who write poems, that's what, see, I don't know how to read or write music. So when I would write a song, it would literally be, it would look like, if you just looked at it, you couldn't see the notes because I'd keep those in my mind. I knew I could hear the music. Yeah. So I'd write down the words and, of course, it would rhyme. And boy, I got, you know, I'd be going out for football or something. You, you just, people who write poems on the football team, it's hard in Georgia if you try to do that. <laughs> but um, without him, which excuse is the me. first. Excuse me. Elvis? Like, mm -hmm. like, like Elvis, the king. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. not the real king, but <laughs> Elvis, you know. <clears throat> and he, and as you know, he was the biggest musician there was in those days. He was bigger than. Madonna and Prince and put you together. Know, oh, you know. man, he was huge, you know, and he he sold six million copies of without him that his gospel album sold more than any of his rock and roll records. Did it really? Wow, it's still selling. I mean, <laughs> they'll pay for this bus, <laughs> praise God, you know. <laughs> but um, I was 17. I just gotten out of high school and I had joined the army. In those days, they'd draft you if you didn't join. And I was uh, in the 81st MP detachment over in uh, Fort Jackson doing my basic, you know, they shaved my head and everything. It was a unique experience. And uh, I was making $84 a month in the uh, 12th Army Corps, and Elvis cut this song, and I didn't know he had cut it. You know, I had hitchhiked over to Memphis. He used to come to this thing called the Quartet Convention, which was held in Memphis. My parents were gospel singers, yeah. so I went to it. And I had a weekend pass, and I hitchhiked from Fort Jackson, which is in Columbia, South Carolina, to Memphis. Got there on Saturday night, sung this song with my family, and they could play the stuff that I sung, you know. Uh, I still couldn't read or write music, but Elvis liked it. They had set up this place on the side of the stage that had these two-way mirrors, so he could see out, but people couldn't see him. And he had his own speakers in there and everything. <laughs> And Priscilla really liked it, and he hadn't married her yet, but she still had great influence on him. And so he recorded the tune. I was back in the Army. I didn't know it. And it made me more money. I mean, I was making $84 a month, and it made me about 90 grand in just a few months. I mean, it was like, <laughs> what? You know what I mean? I had a bicycle. I'd never even had a car. The biggest money I'd ever made was in a, as a paper. I had a paper route, making about $20 a week. All of a sudden, I went and bought me, I got out of the Army, went and bought me a new Corvette. <laughs> Didn't have an attaché case. Didn't even have a checking account. Had $100 bills in a brown paper bag, man. Went to the, you know. <laughs> anyway, you know, oh, man. It, it really changed my life. That first year, um, 126 artists recorded my tunes after Elvis did. I mean, all of a sudden, people recognized me as a writer, and I was just a kid, man. I was a little guy, you know. And, and um, the Oak Ridge Boys and people like the Gaithers, the Imperials, I mean, just everybody, Pat Boone, uh, Mahalia Jackson, Johnny Cash, anybody that did country or gospel, country gospel stuff, did without him. And, you know, I mean, that song took about 20 minutes to write. 
so it was obvious that I should continue to write songs. Sing, sing a little bit of it. Sing just a little bit of it. Without him, I could do nothing. And without him, I'd be enslaved. Without him, I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. I blew the words. Without him, I... Let's see. It's been 28 years. <laughs> I, I know of the the Learjets and the and the plan to. I mean, who who all did you tour with? And well, what I took some of the money from the Presley uh, from those songs and mm -hmm. the writing, you know, and put together a little band called Atlanta Rhythm Section, what later became the Atlanta Rhythm Section, and we started making a record. And just in the middle of the night, like I said, when my parents weren't around, we were writing songs. And this was 1968 when we started, so there was no contemporary Christian music. Yeah. They call it Jesus Rock, and in the Bible Belt, they call it heresy. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was no place to do what we did. Yeah. And uh, I didn't know very much about the Lord anyway. I, I knew that Jesus was the Son of God, but I didn't know what to do about it. I didn't know the meaning of the Word. I, I had uh, been forced to go to church, and thank God I was forced, you know. And my parents took me to church all the time. And, and uh, I, they had even sent me to a couple Bible schools. I got kicked out of two of our best Bible schools in this country yeah. for being a rebellious character. And um, But, you know, I got that group together, and we made this record. It was called We Believe, and we actually made it for Word Records, but when they heard it, they freaked out. I had this guy named Joe South that was a friend of mine. He played sitar. He had just had this record called Games People Play, and he was pretty big. And he had the only electric sitar I'd ever seen, and I asked him to play on one song, and he did, and, and uh, my Christian brothers thought it was demonic or something, so they, they wouldn't put it oh, out. Man. So Atlantic Records bought the record, and I was still singing with my parents, you know, just singing in the gospel group. And uh, they paid me more money than I could have ever imagined. And uh, how much? Uh, in those days, twenty thousand dollars, which I thought was a lot of money for a record. In '68. Yeah, I would have done it for free. <laughs> Don't tell my record company I still would. <laughs> in fact, at times I do. The Who and the Stones and. Um, Oh, man, bands that aren't around anymore, like Grand Funk and Jethro Tull, we toured with Mountain. Mountain was the guy, F Felix Papillardi was my producer. He was the bass player in Mountain. He had produced Cream and some of the bigger bands. He'd made a few million dollars, produced a lot of gold records and platinum records. And uh, he took us out opening for Mountain. Mountain was the forerunner of the metal bands. It was a uh, huge band. Yeah. And uh, we toured with them for about a year until we started getting... Uh, we, we got so many of our own fans that if you start doing too good, the headliner would rather you go yeah. tour with somebody else right. since he owned our band, you know. He had put up the money to start the band, and he was my manager as well as my producer. So he put me out at that point with, um, oh, my goodness. I mean, we opened for everybody. We did festivals all over the world. We played... Uh, I mean, I can't remember all the band's traffic, which was Stevie Winwood's group. We played with Clapton. He, he had um, a group called Blind Faith in those yeah. days. Of course, the Allman Brothers and the Marshall Tucker Band and all the uh, rhythm section, all the bands out of the South, Charlie Daniels. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, What was the coolest car you ever had? <laughs> I don't know. I had a lot of cool cars. <laughs> He's the son of God. That's a fact. He is because of his obedience to God, even unto death, he is now the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he's sitting in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And the Word of God says he's praying for you. He's interceding for all of us, every one of us. And he doesn't wish that any should perish, but all should have everlasting life. And if you want it, you can have it right now. It's just a matter of just simply saying, Jesus, I recognize who you are. I'm sorry for trying to be my own God and my own King and my own Lord. And I need you to forgive me of my sins and come into my heart and be my Lord. And if you, if God's Word says in Romans, the 10th chapter and the 9th, 10th verse, it says, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that God's raised Him from the dead and if you'll confess Jesus is your Lord, you'll be saved. Now listen, if you're not sure if you believe that or not, all you got to do is read His Word. His Word's not like any other book. Read the New Testament. 
Just start reading in the Gospels and let God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. You just hear it in your heart. You just ask God to help you to understand it. Let me ask you a question. What if